The conventional narrative from people who think about American education is that during the 1920s, 30s, and up to the 50s, something called progressive education came into the schools. Critics say it ruined education. Um, others say that it kind of helped to make education more relevant. But the general narrative is that this movement called progressivism came in. It made schools more child-centered. It made it so that instruction really was more about catering to the child's interests, aptitudes, and abilities, and making instruction more relevant to the real world, rather than learning classical languages and memorizing poems and things like that. So I'm going to uh, complicate that narrative a little bit, because it's a bit too simple. There are actually two different types of progressivism that historians who study education really agree on. And these two types of progressivism kind of had root in two different thinkers that I'll talk about. Uh, the first is John Dewey. John Dewey was an American philosopher. I'm sure people who have studied education here have heard his name before. And his writings were largely a prominence between the 1910s into the 40s. He was a philosopher who really um, focused on things like how, how we can make the schools fit the needs of a democratic society that's socially just and respects individuals and things like that. So books that he wrote were called things like The Child and the, the, Child and the Curriculum or Democracy and Education very philosophical texts. On the right, we have Edward Thorndike, and unlike Dewey, Thorndike was a psychologist, not a philosopher, and he was much more grounded in trying to make psychology and particularly how people learn into a science. So he wrote books with more scientific sounding names like educational psychology or human learning. And these two approaches, the philosopher on the left and the psychologist who wanted to make things into a science, on the right had uh, two kind of different versions of progressivism. They agree in some ways, but they disagree in most of the details. First of all, let's talk about what kind of progressivism each favored. So Dewey on the left favored what most historians call pedagogical progressivism. It's really concerned with uh, changing how teacher and student interact with each other, making sure that learning is as, as child-centered as it can be and has application to the real world. So instead of doing abstract thought, children learn by doing. On the right side, uh, Thorndike advocated for what historians now tend to call administrative progressivism. And it's called administrative rather than pedagogical because Thorndike was really concerned that we change the structure of the school to fit the structures of modern society. So just like in the 20s and 30s, you're starting to see the rise of the modern corporation. Uh, Thorndike really kind of thought that schools needed to change how they structured themselves as well. They could become big, comprehensive schools that in some ways resembled corporations. Now, where they both agreed was that education needs to be child-centered, but and it needs to really take its cue from the individual child. So instruction, if at all possible, should be differentiated by the child's aptitudes, interests, and things like that. They both agreed on this because by the 1920s, it was still fairly typical for people to go to school and spend a lot of time memorizing poems and then reciting poems, memorizing facts about history and reciting facts about history, learning classical languages, stuff that maybe didn't have a lot of value. So both Dewey and Thorndike really said, look, we need to make sure that schools not only have a real world relevance, but that we take the interests and aptitudes of the child into account. But again, the theme of this video is that they really differed in a lot of the details. So on the left side, John Dewey really thought that the child-centered curriculum was justified because, first of all, learning and doing should not be separate things. Schools traditionally focused on learning abstract knowledge so that people could go out and do things. Well, Dewey thought that learning and, and doing were in some ways the same thing. In fact, a lot of times we learn by doing, not reading a manual, memorizing facts, and then doing. Uh, Dewey also thought that things like the manual trades, things like the arts, weren't necessary just to train people to do like trades or whatever. Uh, he thought it really helped children learn how to think. So instead of learning abstract facts or, or you know, uh, memorizing things and reciting them, he really thought that the best kind of learning is learning how to think and learning how to think critically, which again happens best by doing. On the other hand, Edward Thorndike had a different reason for preferring child-centered education with real-world relevance. He thought that uh, child-centered education was best simply because children look like they have different aptitudes. And as long as you could figure out what a child's aptitudes were, you could figure out what academic track was best for the child. Some children may be best equipped to learn manual trades. Some children may be best equipped to learn higher level things that might prepare them for college. But uh, 
he thought it was folly to treat everyone kind of the same because all children, he said, really had different aptitudes. As for real world relevance, Thorndike had a different reason for that as well. Thorndike thought that schools uh, in, the, in, in their pre-1920 condition really taught children things that they just wouldn't need to know in the real world marketplace. The best thing that schools can do for Thorndike was really to prepare people to go into the careers and trades that they need to go into. Most people don't need to learn languages, memorize historical facts and things. So he really thought that the best thing schools could do is prepare people for trades. So where Dewey thought that the trades, learning the trades was relevant because it taught critical thinking skills, Thorndike thought that learning manual trades was relevant because it would prepare people for those manual trades. The purpose of education, they also differ a little bit on. So you can probably guess by now uh, some of this. But So Dewey's idea about the purpose of education is we're trying to prepare human beings to be critical thinkers, participants in a democracy, in a liberal society that respects individualism, but also creates cooperation between people. So, you know, his books like Democracy and Education really talk about making sure that we prepare children to be intelligent actors in the world, be respectful, be good citizens, things like that. Edward Thorndike, on the other hand, thought that the, the best thing schools could do, the purpose of schooling, really was to prepare people for not only modern society, which he wasn't averse to, but the modern economy. Uh, since most people spend a large portion of their time working, Thorndike thought that the best thing we can do is, number one, sort people into educational tracks where they can go into the careers that might best fit their aptitudes, but also um, prepare them for those aptitudes. So it wasn't enough to do book learning. You should have some preparation for going into the trades that you'll probably excel in. As for student-centered education, again, they, um, the, the question is how, how did each want to achieve this student-centered approach? Well, again, they had differing visions. Uh, for, for Dewey, it was a really a process of negotiation between teacher and student. Teachers, he thought, really had to be uh, very intelligent people who could kind of figure out what, how the instruction was being received by students. What are the students' aptitudes? What are the students' interests? How can I create things that really engage their interests? And then after you, you know, try an activity with them, figure out, was that, did they respond well to that? If so, I'm going to keep doing it. If not, I'm going to change some things. But Dewey really thought that it really was up to the teacher to do that. Now, Thorndike thought that uh, as a psychologist, he was a big fan of some of the intelligence testing and aptitude testing that was coming about during the 1920s. And he figured, okay, if all students have differing abilities, which he very much believed, we can create tests. And what we'll do is we'll have students take those tests periodically and figure out what track they should be on. So we can teach large numbers of students at the same time while still respecting individuality because this group tested this way on the tests and this group tested this other way on the tests. So things like the remedial uh, classes, the average classes, and the honors classes were something roughly like what Thorndike probably had in mind. Or things like the vocational track or the college prep track are things that I think Thorndike probably would have had kind of in mind with that. Now, the, the last question we're going to deal with, which really encompasses, I think, the, the core of the difference between these two guys, is uh, the question of can education be a science? Can we discover laws, uh, educational laws that are universally applicable so that we can figure out the science of teaching, pedagogy, which is supposed to be a science? Well, Dewey wrote a, a book called The Sources of Science and Education, and in that book he really said that education may be able to have some scientific aspects to it. We can discover how, what works and what doesn't, but really at the end of the day, children are all different individuals. The brain is a complex thing. We can't really figure out what the laws of thinking are. So Dewey thought that at the end of the day, student-centered education could not be a science. It was really about the teacher kind of using her or his discretion and judgment to really figure out what the students' aptitudes were, what their interests are, uh, changes over time and things like that. But it just couldn't be systematized in any kind of body of scientific knowledge. Now, Thorndike, of course, was a psychologist. And he really believed that, yes, we could figure out some of those laws of learning. In fact, Thorndike, in his books like Education, Psychology, and Human Learning, thought that he was starting to discover those laws, the laws of effect, the law of exercise, which you can read uh, further in some other website. But these were ideas that Thorndike had of how we can really figure out the universal laws of education. Now, Thorndike did believe that individuals were different but he really looked at learning differences as variations on the same theme. If we can find out the theme of how people learn, then the variations 
we can also figure out those, and they, I mean, we can figure out a scientific body of knowledge. So in some ways, he didn't really think that the teacher needed to be kind of a creative person who was revising and figuring out the students' interests and aptitudes and revising assignments. He really thought that we could structure some sort of more standardized approach. So at the end of the day, uh, a historian named Ellen Condiff Lagerman, who studied these two extensively, said at the end of the day, in terms of schools and how they're structured, Edward Thorndike won and Dewey lost. And there's a few reasons for that. If you are um, politicians who are thinking about public schools and especially how to educate so many people, because there's still a large influx of people coming into the United States and there's just a large number of students, uh, Edward Thorndike's approach would probably look more attractive to you because he's saying we can standardize this approach. We can scale this approach up in the speak of economics. We can don't have to have small schools and small classes like Dewey would suggest where teachers need to really know each one of their students. We can have students take tests and that would substitute kind of for the individual teacher's judgment about which group to put students in and what level is appropriate for them. The other reason is that schools were getting bigger and uh, Thorndike's visions really appealed to administrators who wanted to create and leverage systems of education. They wanted to create schools that had a certain set structure. They didn't want to create these individual kind of small schools that John Dewey's approach had in mind. So Thorndike's vision really did speak much more to administrators and politicians, which is why really the schools that we have today with the testing, the, the, the different tracks that we put students on, is, is a fairly Thorndike-like uh, vision. But who won the teachers? Just like Thorndike's approach really spoke to administrators and politicians, uh, Dewey's more teacher-oriented and student-oriented approach really spoke to teachers. First of all, because it was student-centered, of course, and, and teachers generally like kind of being student-centered and getting to know students and things like that. It becomes a more personal, exciting job when you do it the Deweyan way. But also, uh, he put the teachers at the, at the center of authority in terms of how do we create student-centered education. We do it by giving teachers discretion and judgment. Whereas Thorndike wanted to put the hands in the administrators and the system builders Dewey really thought that the discretion had to be with the teachers. Education could not be a science, it was an art, it was a craft, and the people who practice that craft are the teachers. So when we think about making education student-centered, the Deweyan approach would be leave that in the hands of the teachers they know best. Obviously, a system like that, an argument like that, would be much more attractive to teachers and probably less attractive to administrators who, because both groups in some, in some sense would like to have that discretion or maybe even power, if you will. So that's a, uh, a digression into the history of education. It complicates the issue of progressivism taking over schools because in one way it did, of course, but in another way it didn't because um, there were these two different kinds of progressivism. At the end of the day, modern schools probably owe a little bit more to Thorndike, but I think the teacher's views are more hospitable to John Dewey, and of course John Dewey is a, a big name in the history of education, so he definitely had an effect as well.